Rebecca Paul Carcel, back with part two of a speech from Henry V. This is the night before the big battle of Agincourt, when the king is alone. He's been visiting the troops and kind of cheering them up, but now he's by himself and he's reflecting on the burdens of kingship. And the last thing he said was, Oh, be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Meaning, okay, greatness, you know, like fame, celebrity, power. If you have a sickness, if you're ill, can you be cured just by that, by being famous or being powerful? No. So he's talking to greatness and saying, hey, greatness, if you're sick, can ceremony cure you? The answer is no. And by ceremony, he means like all the rituals and you know, things people do like bow in front of the king or the actual ceremonies they go through, uh, like the coronation and just how you treat a king. None of that really matters that much or it can't make a difference in something like your health. All right, and he goes on in that same vein about health. Thinkest thou the fiery fever will go out with titles blown from adulation? Will it give place to flexure and low bending? Canst thou, when thou commands the beggar's knee, command the health of it? Okay, so these are all asking kind of the same question as before. In particular, fever. Will titles like, oh, king, duke, you know, his majesty, will that help you if you have a fever? No. <laughs> um, from adulation means... Uh, someone giving you all this flattery and so on, that's not going to help you with the fever. Will it give place to flexure? Meaning, will the fever retreat just because somebody is bowing or kneeling in front of you, low bending? No, no, it won't. Can you, canst thou, when thou commandest the beggar's knee, can you, ceremony, you know, formality, can you, when you command the beggar to kneel before you, or like the peasant to kneel before you, can you command that the health in that knee be given to you, the king? No, you can't. So it's not that great. <laughs> sure, people kneel before you, but it doesn't give you much. It can't do something like cure you if you're sick. So he's pointing out the emptiness, the hollowness of all these rituals that surround being famous, being powerful, being the king. So he says, No, thou proud dream that playest so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know. Tis not the balm, the scepter and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, the first title running for the king, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, no. Not all these, thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these, laid in bed majestical, can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave. And I'm going to stop in the middle of a sentence. Um, all right, so he says, no, thou proud dream. So he's calling ceremony and greatness a dream. It's not very real. It's not very substantial. You play so subtly with the king's repose, you, you play so craftily with a king's relaxation. Like you, ceremony, make the king think that you're really great, but I am a king, he says, and find thee. Like I have discovered the truth, and I know that all this long list of things, the balm, the scepter, the ball, balm is like um, an oil that you get anointed with if you're crowned king. And the scepter is like this important stick that you hold and the ball is on top of the stick and so all these you know accoutrement like the baggage and luggage of a king like the crown itself none of this is that important the sword the mace which is another weapon right the crown his robe that's intertissued that means that it's like folded into it is uh, layered in gold and pearl it's you know how it's a beautiful fabric but it doesn't mean much, right? It can't make you healthy if you're sick. It can't give you peace in your heart or your conscience. 
the first title running for, meaning before the king, meaning the thing you put ahead of his name, like the great and glorious majestical King Henry V, you know, all of that, his majesty, those sorts of, those sorts of titles, uh, phrases. No, that's the throne, the tide of pomp. No, none of this is as great <laughs> as it seems like it should be. Now, here's an interesting uh, metaphor. He says, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. So pomp, like all of that special treatment, it's like a tide that lands against the shore of the world. But he says, no, not all of these thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical. So even if you are treated this way, you're treated very special because you're the king, but when you lie down in your bed, you can't sleep so soundly as the wretched slave. And he doesn't strictly mean enslaved people here. The word slave can be broader. It can mean peasant, um, laborer, but any lower person, you know, non-royalty person will sleep better than this king, he's saying, <laughs> who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest. Crammed with distressful bread, never sees horrid night the child of hell. But like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus, and all night sleeps in Elysium. So this is the king saying, peasants sleep well. <laughs> Their life is simple enough that they can just eat and sleep and labor in the day and, and just have a decent life and not have the kinds of worries and stresses that he has. Um, so he says, the wretched slave who with a body filled and vacant mind, meaning like uh, someone who has eaten and then vacant mind, not insulting this person, their intelligence or anything, but just saying like, now you don't have any more worries. Like the worries of the day are over and so you can just go to sleep. And that person gets to rest, crammed with distressful bread, meaning food that you had to work for. So it doesn't mean that the food is stressing you or making you sick or anything. It just means that you had to labor for the food. But now you have had it. And you get to rest, and you don't see the horrid night, the child of hell. Shakespeare puts hell and night together a lot. So the idea that you would be up all night is a scary possibility and something you would want to avoid. Like, night is not for people. You should be asleep. And if you're this simple peasant, then you get to sleep. But if you're the king, like right now, Henry V is walking around the camp the night before the battle alone, and he told his men to rest, to get sleep, because they are going to be battling in the morning. But he has too many things to think about and plan and worry about, so he doesn't get a good night's sleep. And that's true even at other times, not only the night before a battle. Now, you might think um, that, again, he may be romanticizing the peasant's situation. Are all peasants going to bed nice and well-fed, happy with their day's labor, uh, maybe not, <laughs> but from his perspective, that simpler life looks pretty good right now because he has so much on his shoulders. All right, and then there's this part, but like a lackey, meaning a person who is the footman. So the footman uh, is the, the servant who goes in front of the carriage or opens the door from a carriage, like a horse-drawn carriage, and let's, you know, so that somebody can get out of it like a king. So he says, but like a lackey from the rise to set sweats in the eye of Phoebus. That's the sun. So Phoebus is the god of sun. We have a bunch of Greek uh, references here, Greek mythology references. And so the peasant is working like a lackey, like a footman to the, the sun, which in Greek mythology, is carried in a chariot across the sky, right? So the peasant is like someone who works while the sun is out, right? And he thinks this is, this is kind of nice. And all night sleeps in Elysium, which is like a heaven place for people who have behaved well. They get to spend their days in this idyllic place called Elysium, again, with the Greek mythology. So he sees 
the peasants as having a nice life. Like they get to work in the day, sleep at night, in heaven actually, at night. Next day after dawn doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse and follows so the ever-running year with profitable labor to his grave. And but for ceremony such a wretch, winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand and vantage of a king. Okay, so d next day after dawn doth rise and help Hyperion, that's the sun again, to his horse. And again, the peasant is here seen as like rising with the sun and um, like as early as dawn gets started, as the god of day gets on his horse and pulls the sun across the sky. And in this way follows the ever running year. So day after day, the peasant is doing this with profitable labor to his grave. So his days are spent with profitable work. His nights are spent with deep, peaceful sleep. It's a good life. And he says, but for ceremony, so except for ceremony, such a wretch, and not a wretch like somebody, uh, we use the word wretch now to mean someone who's very unfortunate, but he means somewhat that, but, but not that they're unfortunate, because he's saying how fortunate they are. Like, these people are lucky. They don't have as much to worry about as I do. But such a person who works hard, who doesn't have any big status or wealth, but just works, that laborer person winding up days with toil, with work, and nights with sleep had the forehand, meaning has the front place, a place in front of the king, and vantage, advantage over a king. So he's saying they have the better life, <laughs> which again is probably romanticizing the peasant life, but he's under enormous stress right now because he is responsible for this battle that's coming, planning for the battle, and on top of that, I think he feels like it's lonely at the top. He can't like discuss with other people exactly things that like not everyone can know everything he knows. He has his nobles and he has, you know, family members, but the king is the king. You know, everything comes to his door, his plate, you know, into his hands. And it's true, nobody has quite the responsibility the king has. Um, so that's why he says you common people have an advantage because your days can just be like work and sleep and, you know, it's a simpler situation. Going on. The slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it, but in gross brain, little what's what watch the king keeps to maintain the peace, whose hours the peasant best advantages. And this is the end of the speech. So the slave, and as I've explained, really, you know, the peasant, the worker, a member of the country's peace, meaning someone who partakes in the peace, who gets to enjoy when the country is at peace. They enjoy the peace, you know, doing their life, doing their labor and so on. But the king doesn't get to enjoy it because the king has to make sure we stay at peace. So the next line says, enjoys it, meaning the peasant enjoys it, but in gross brain, which doesn't mean what it means now, um, but more like dull, you know, like a brain that doesn't have to do as much as the king has to. <laughs> so like his simple brain, little watts, like little understands or little knows what watch the king keeps to maintain the peace. So the king has to always be thinking of how to keep the peace, you know, making treaties with other countries or whatever it is to try to secure the peace of the nation. But the people in the nation just enjoy it once it's secure and don't even realize what the king has to be doing to maintain it. Whose hours the peasant best advantages. So once we have peace in the nation, that those hours of peace are best enjoyed, most enjoyed by the peasants, by the members of the country, and less by the king. So that's why they have the best advantage in peacetime, because the king is busy maintaining the peace. 
Okay, so I find this a very interesting speech. Normally we think kings have all the advantages. Kings have the best life ever. And here he is saying, no, I really don't. Um, regular people have a good life too for different reasons. And right now, with so much on his shoulders, he's kind of jealous of the common person because everything is up to him. All right. One fun thing, if you want to compare this poem to something kind of modern, or this speech, um, go see a song called It's Hard to Be the Bard. And it comes from a recent musical called Something Rotten. And I got to see it on Broadway some years ago. And you can still find It's Hard to Be the Bard on YouTube. And it's fun to compare that character, Shakespeare, who is saying, oh, it's so hard to be Shakespeare, you know, to be famous, to be this big playwright. Oh, and I like to compare that to Henry V saying how difficult it is for him to be king. So that could be a fun exercise. All right, thanks for joining me, and definitely come back, and we'll do, we'll do some more fun literature stuff. <laughs>